Let's see, there were four persons who want to say something. We see if we, if we gather the statements, maybe just start. Okay. Um, as loud as you can. Yeah, I try. You are, you, uh, we are used to analyzing the accumulation of debt and the um, concentration of wealth as a capitalist problem. You are saying it's not only a capitalist problem, it happens across history. So, how do you explain this uh, innate tendency, obviously, of, do you, are you saying all societies, to this concentration of debt and land and wealth? Uh, is there an explanation you have for it? Does that does it have to happen every time in a society? Um, well, I think it depends on what kind of society. Uh, I'm talking about societies that are already based on a fundamental inequality. Uh, if a society is divided into classes and they are using a form of impersonal money, it's almost inevitable that those with the resources to create money will use that to enslave, you know, further enslave those over whom they have power and use the ideology of debt to lock in that power. So I don't think that it's a matter of there's some primordial fault in human beings that will somehow always generate that. In fact, throughout history, you find people who refuse to behave that way. Societies based on absolutely avoiding uh, that kind of logic. And that will take many forms of uh, anything from extremely egalitarian societies to you know, the society of the great epics, which are um, you know, not equal at all, but they're refusing to use money. And, Everything becomes a contest and a game as a way of like uh, just ensuring that that kind of accumulation of debt never takes place. Um, so I think what we're looking at is a kind of one of many potentials in human society that becomes realized under certain circumstances. Um, as a, a veteran of the global justice uh, protests. Um, in Seattle and your uh, contributing thoughts to the Occupy movement. I was wondering if you could give us some practical suggestions um, to make the most of this um, strange situation in Frankfurt tonight and tomorrow. Ah, uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> my own experience, uh, in my own experience, what I'm seeing in Frankfurt most resembles the IMF meetings of, it was 2002. The first IMF meetings after 9-11, um, we weren't sure we should even do it because the situation was you know, so in favor of the police or the national movement, we felt we had to. 2,000, 3,000 anarchists, maybe four, uh, showed up. Yeah, I've seen that board in Frankfurt, but, um, and we were immediately surrounded by 20 or 30,000 police. Uh, we're very aggressive. I mean, in fact, at one point they, they surrounded us next to the IMF building, uh, the World Bank building, which is completely made of glass. And um, usually they don't allow us anywhere near it. And they kept us there for two hours, waiting for us to throw a brick. Uh, of course we didn't. And, um, uh, and it was very demoralizing because we were so outnumbered. Um, and they mobilized every conceivable resource. They had the army, they had tanks, they had police. Um, and we left feeling terrible. But, and this is what really shocked me, I happened to know someone who had a friend who was going to the IMF meetings. And he said it was horrible. They didn't really have the IMF meetings. They shut down everything. The police had cordon after cordon you had to go through. All of the parties were canceled. All of the ceremonial events were canceled. Most people didn't even come. Basically, they didn't have IMF meetings. Um, and I thought about that. And I thought, that's amazing. Because what that shows you is that whoever is running global capitalism is terrified of us. I mean, we're like 3,000 pathetic anarchists. You know? uh, we didn't do anything. And like they would rather we go home feeling miserable than that the IMF meets. Think about that for a moment. I mean, we're very important to them. Um, so, so I think that they were having a similar situation here. I think for the last 30 years, the top priority of the people running the global capitalist system is that meetings like this never happen. They were so frightened by what happened in the 60s 
that they've constructed layer on layer of preemption against any possibility that people involved in social movements should feel that they are accomplishing anything. Uh, I, 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 after that IMF meeting, for example, I started looking around and thinking, and I realized, well, the same is true of the war, isn't it? The people running the war in Iraq and Afghanistan are obsessed with preventing an effective anti-war movement. They talk about it. They say we must overcome the Vietnam syndrome. But what they mean is, um, we have to prevent any effective opposition, both at home and within the military, to uh, military adventures, and that's much more important to them than whether they win the war. Uh, in fact, they created terms of engagement, which guarantee they aren't going to win the war. Um, they, make, you know, they have this calculus, how many dead bodies to how many protesters. So they make sure that there are very few dead bodies by creating terms of engagement, which ensure they massacre civilians regularly to make sure that no soldiers die, or very, very few. Uh, as a result, everybody hates them, they're never going to win the war. Uh, opposition grows, but they don't care. It's more important to them that anti-war movement is not effective than that they win. So I think if you look at global capitalism as a whole, I think it's the same thing. I think that neoliberalism is a gigantic system for depoliticization and preventing social movements. Um, if you look at it step by step, it makes suddenly everything makes sense. Uh, precarious labor, uh, that's a great example. Or the fact that they keep wanting people to work more and more, even though it's not economically viable. Um, I mean, you, you don't get better laborers if you have them frightened and overworked. Um, in fact, the effectiveness economically is, is, is terrible. However, it's brilliant in depoliticizing labor and breaking the power of unions and preventing people from having the time to engage in political activity, uh, making them too scared to be able to contemplate it. Um, over and over again, they created this situation where the only battle they won is the ideological battle. Um, the system, and as a result, they're destroying capitalism. They're, they're, they're not, in the same way that they're like willing to lose the war to prevent an uh, anti-war movement, they're destroying capitalism to try to preempt any possibility of an anti-capitalist movement. Um, but it is being destroyed, it's crumbling around us. So I think that what we see here in Frankfurt is this incredible overkill where they're willing to shut down the government functions and bring in thousands and thousands of police. Um, shows just how seriously, just how frightened they are of us. And we need to remember that at every moment. World trade organization hides in Doha and in Singapore. The fence has become even more expensive. This is the first preemptive fortress. Yeah, uh, you were talking about Jubilee as a, a means of solving the current situation. Yeah, I've been shouting all day, so I'm a bit... Um, <laughs> yeah, uh, but uh, it seems to me that all that would do is reset uh, the system to a certain point and allow it to continue much in the same manner. I mean, isn't it time that we uh, think uh, next step, what comes beyond what we have been repeating for the last 5,000 years, and what could that be? Well, remember that capitalism has not existed for 5,000 years. Um, I think, so uh, capitalism is just this one cycle, and I rather think that the end result of the movement uh, away from capitalism, which I believe a jubilee would speed along, uh, is will be to come up with something else. I, I am deeply concerned that the next thing they come up with will be even worse. Um, I think all the more reason to work on imagining something better. But a jubilee isn't an answer to the problem. So jubilee is, is, is to me, it's a conceptual reset. It's a way of beginning to think again. Uh, because we boxed ourselves into a conceptual hole. I mean, partly because of this ideological offensive against the imagination. Uh, but as a result of that, you know, we, 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 so many things are taken for granted that we lose the sense of, of these things are human creations that we can do otherwise. So I don't think of the Jubilee as a solution. I think of it as a first step to open up our sense of possibilities. Once we realize that money is just this thing that we make. Yes, but uh, but wouldn't a jubilee, you know, if a Boston uh, group, consulting group, is sort of proposing it now, it seems that the, the rich and powerful are discovering it as a tool to perpetuate a system. They're desperate for something. Yeah. Um, and and uh, they're, uh, if they're looking at that, you know they know they're in trouble. <laughs> and um, sure, they're going to try desperate measures, and desperate measures don't always work. 
the way they're intended to work. Um, obviously, I find myself in the funny situation where members of the ruling class are coming to me saying, help us save capitalism. Well, I don't want to save capitalism. <laughs> On the other hand, um, I think if I thought that a jubilee would really save capitalism, I wouldn't be suggesting it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, coming here, I talk with people. Coming here, I talk with people about like lo-fi, and they were just not concerned at all. Like, what people? Uh, everybody. Passers by. Yeah, passers by, and like they were just not concerned. Like I would like to ask you, what would be for you the best solution to raise people awareness? Well, I think that the media is never going to do it for us. I think that um, in Occupy, we had a brief moment of about two months where the media was actually covering what we did. And most of the people like me who were, have been doing this for 10, 12 years, we couldn't understand what was happening. It's like, wait, we say something, we do an interview, and they print what we say. That's never happened before. Um, <laughs> We're actually covering it when the police attack us. That's that's crazy. Um, it was a small win, and it turned out to be a very particular political conjunction whereby a lot of liberal groups thought they could take over the movement, and then when they realized they couldn't, suddenly the media disappeared. Um, however, however, um, I think that you can't prove to people that a different way of doing things is possible. You can't convince them through logical argument. You can only show them. Uh, but nothing is more powerful than, than bringing people to a place where they see these things happen. Um, I mean, it worked on me, I didn't know. Um, I actually wasn't at Seattle. I, I was walked out of my class one day uh, where I was teaching. I saw a headline, martial law declared in Seattle. Uh, because, of course, they hadn't been covering it, so it was a great surprise uh, to all of us in America. And, you know, I said, oh, this is great, where do I join? Um, and I walked in and I, I, you know, discovered these people sitting there in meetings of thousands of people coming to decisions about a leadership structure. I was astounded. I, I mean, you know, I always considered myself an anarchist on paper, but I, even I had never imagined that would be possible. So I think the more that these, we, we create institutions that actually begin to affect people's everyday lives, uh, intervene in real, genuine, practical problems. That's what we're doing in Occupy. Um, we lost a lot of the media attention, and we lost a lot of the money, which is great, uh, because the money was destroying us. Um, it's another story. Um, but um, what we have done is we've started to create thousands of local campaigns, um, well, maybe not hundreds, yes, uh, across America. Um, <laughs> Occupy homes, Occupy farms, you know, we have like, I, uh, upwards of a dozen Occupy farms in New York alone. Um, the farms that had been foreclosed. Um, so we're gradually, you know, we have to be the thing that's there when things fall apart, because things are starting to fall apart. Um, we have to be the people with the skill, organizational skills that can start picking things up. And we can start doing that now. It will start on a small scale. But nothing threatens the powers that be more than the threat of a good example. Simply showing that things are possible, that people did not believe to be possible, immediately changes people's horizons of possibility. In their political sense. Yeah. Stop the 
Absolutely, yes, that's just, right. Just no longer <laughs> continuing paying interest, for instance, uh, paying uh, taxes, for instance, or a state who is just doing only one job, just trying to save this system. Um, I totally agree with you that, that I don't want to ask the lords running the system for favors. Ah, the question was, why are we talking about a jubilee? We should take matters into our own hands. Uh, we should have a debt strike. We should not pay, refuse to pay taxes, refuse to pay interest. Uh, to which my response is, that is of course the ideal. Um, I don't particularly want to ask the people running the world for favors. Um, I mean, if they want to do a favor, I can give them an idea of what. But I'm not going to demand it. I'm not going to base my politics on, on, on appealing to authorities that I do not consider to be legitimate. The ideal is always to do, do it yourself. The problem is it's, it's proved historically rather difficult to organize debtors. Um, it's been done in a few places. And, uh, but the question is, you know, because debt tends to isolate and, and humiliate people. People feel guilty. It's very difficult to get, oh, get massive numbers of people to overcome that. We're working on it. We're trying. Um, in New York, for example, we have a Occupy Student Debt Camp. And one thing we're, we've done there is to have a pledge. Nobody wants to default on their own, because um, if you default on a student debt, you can get $10,000 in penalties sometimes. They have crazy laws now, punitive laws. Um, however, um, what we've done is we've created a pledge where people all agree <laughs> where people all agree that once we have, say, 50,000 names on this pledge, then everyone stops simultaneously. That seems to be the way to go with it. Yeah. Are they? Yes. They're doing a lot of things. Yeah. We're probably going to be doing <laughs> We take the last... We take the last questions. There is one, two, three. We take them together, because it's already the end. And is there another question which I did not see? No, there isn't. So it's one, two, um, three. Yeah, three or the third one. And then the final uh, word to David. And then the very last question comes from my side. Okay. Um, I have two questions. The first is um, the Can you hear me? I can hear you yesterday. You imagine I'm part of the protest. 
protest, you try to do something against capitalism, the movement, and you realize that you are targets, uh, they are all somehow infested themselves with capitalism, capitalist ideas, but they don't know. How do you make sure to help them to get, off, to get these ideas out of their minds and to make sure that you and them live in the same reality? <laughs> Um, yeah, um, I, I actually think that, again, this is one of those cases where you can't prove something to people, you have to show them. Um, you know, you can argue with a libertarian, you know, cap pro, or anarcho-capitalist or someone like that for a hundred years. That's what they like to do with our um, The best thing to do is to create something. Um, when I talk to uh, people who are sort of, you know, there are people in America, not that many as you think, but there are more of these sort of free market anarchists or free market libertarian types who um, claim to be on the same page except they're pro-capitalist. I always say the same thing. I say, well, look, uh, let's get rid of the state and see what happens, you know? Uh, you think there'll be a market? I don't. Uh, we'll see who's right. And um, I'm pretty confident that this is not a problem because, all right, the way I always put it to them, uh, imagine there's an island and it's divided in half, and half of them are a bunch of anarcho-capitalists. Um, they create a society where nobody gets anything unless they, you know, form a contract and there's no social guarantees. Some people have property, some don't. Um, then the other ones form a, a, a left anarchist collective where everybody's guaranteed their basic needs. So, for what possible reason would the prolific guys who don't have property on one side of the island want to stay there? Everybody always says, well, you know, you're going to need that coercion to stop me from hiring people to take my strawberries. Nobody ever says you're going to need coercion to um, stop me from hiring myself out to pick somebody else's strawberries. Because nobody actually wants to do that if they have any choice. So I really don't think these things are going to be a problem once we start actually building alternative institutions. Um, I'm, I'm interested in this idea that the Iraq War and the Vietnam War and uh, were uh, uh, responding to these democratic social movements. How, how do you determine that? Well, I don't. I mean, how can you tell what the reality of what people were thinking actually is? And every historical event is overdetermined. There's always a million reasons. Yet the pattern is unmistakable. Um, in, in every time you do have an outbreak of, of um, democratic social movements, you do see the same pattern. They make surprisingly rapid concessions. And somehow a war gets started, and it's a voluntary war, you know? It's not a war that's more <coughs> Um So it could be a coincidence, but three times in a row seems a bit much, you know? My very last question. So David, is you are also writing about love. Love. Liebe. Um, yeah, I understand love is indivisible and or it's an attitude in every situation. Also when the police is not polite to you. So maybe as we still uh, will meet the police. Can you give the last advice to the occupiers yeah, with their inner attitude? Just your experience, your whatever you want to say. Well, you know, police are like anyone else. They're all different. Some of them are horrible uh, as individuals. Most are not. But, but um, I think that um, the thing that we need to remember about the police and the forces of repression is that, this is what I always say, um, to sort of insurrectionary anarchists too, is, well, we're never going to militarily defeat the army. You know, we're not going to go to battle against the 101st Airborne Division and win, you know? Uh, they're very good at violence. In fact, it's the only thing they're really very good at. Um, they'll always be better than us. And, um, well, that reflects well on us, I think. Um, now, I think that, um, so therefore, when when anarchists win, when, when radical social movements really win, it's because they refuse to shoot us. 
ultimately it will come down to a choice, and those people will be given a choice of either killing us or not killing us. And generally speaking in history, they usually refuse when it comes down to a, a, a when the stakes are really high, when it's clear that the people are genuinely off against them. Now, of course, the other thing is you can't be, if you're too nice to the force of the border, you never get to the point where they have to make that choice. <laughs> We have to bring them to that choice, but we have to put them in a situation where they will make the choice that it's right to make. Uh, historically, that's what happens over and over again. I mean, even the Russian Revolution, there was an entire army that was sent to St. Petersburg and deserted. Um, even the revolutions that we think are largely violent were largely won by persuading the guys with the guns not to fire them. That's what it's going to come down to in the end.